Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm delighted that you're joining us for the announcement of the winners of this year's Excellence in Historic Preservation Awards. It's always one of my favorite events of the year. I'm Frank Sanchez, Chair of the Preservation League of New York State's Board of Trustees. To all of our members and supporters in the audience, thank you very much for everything that you do to make our work and programs like this possible. For those of you who aren't yet familiar with what we do around the state, the Excellence Awards is a perfect introduction. This annual event uh, has been a, a core program of the League since 1984, and it allows us to recognize and celebrate the very best achievements in the field of historic preservation. Before COVID, we typically have our celebration of this event in person in New York City. Uh, this is the third year that we're announcing our award winners virtually. And while we miss the in-person event, we absolutely love that we get to share these statewide awards with a statewide audience, and we plan to continue to do so. We really do want to celebrate our excellence award winners far and wide and so thank you for tuning in tonight from all over New York State and beyond. In fact, uh, it would be great if you let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat. This year, our jury recognized winners in each of our award categories. We'll be celebrating seven preservation projects as actual physical preservation projects, plus one organization, one publication, and one individual. I think you'll be inspi as inspired by all of them uh, as we on the jury were when we selected them. Tonight's event has been sponsored in part by Mr. Robert A. M. Stern, FAIA, and Robert A. M. Stern Architects. Many thanks to them. We really do appreciate it. Before I th turn things over to our host for the evening, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping notes. First of all, Closed captioning is available for tonight's program. If you need or want subtitles, you can, tune to you can choose to turn those on using the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The webinar is being recorded and you will be able to find the full program and all the short videos we're about to share on our website and our YouTube channel after tonight's event. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And we'll be sure to drop relevant links in the chat as we go through the program. And as we all know, technology can be fickle, especially for me, so please bear with us if we encounter any technical difficulties. With that, I'm going to turn things over to my fellow board members, uh, to my fellow board and awards committee member, Caroline Passion, and League President Jay DiLorenzo. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Jay. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Frank. Hi, everyone. Our awards committee chair, Charlotte Worthy, unfortunately couldn't join us tonight, but we know she's with us in spirit. Caroline and Jay will be guiding us through tonight's awards and it promises, as it is every year, to be a really interesting show. Caroline, Jay, it's all yours. Take it away. Thanks, Frank. And thank you all for joining us tonight. We look forward to this event all year and we're eager to shine a light on the 10 award winners our jury has selected. Absolutely. This year's jury process was notable because we received so many extraordinary nominations. The quantity and the quality were inspiring and it made our job that much more difficult. But our final list of winners are truly standouts representing an interesting cross section of issues impacting the field of historic preservation today. Our award winners are making their communities stronger through their efforts, opening doors to what's possible when preservation is embraced. So on behalf of the awards jury, I just wanna extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who submitted a nomination this year. We really loved reading each and every one and learning more about the great work happening in every corner of our state. I'm relatively new to the league board, and so I was really honored to serve on the awards jury this year. I want to thank my fellow board member and award committee chair, Charlotte Worthy, for guiding our process and inviting me to be a part of such a wonderful program. And I also want to thank our fellow jury members, Jay DeLorenzo, 
Gregory Long, Richard Maitino, Frank Sanchez, Arita Warren, and Stephen Wilder. You all put such great care into a review of each project, and it really was a pleasure working with you all. And now I am proud to present the winners of the 2022 Excellence in Historic Preservation Awards. We approached this project not as a restoration, but as a preservation. We wanted to respect it like a ruin of Rome, where we knew that we couldn't bring it back to its original glory, but we could save what was here and enjoy what was here from a you know, deconstructed sense. The inspiration for this project really was the building itself. The fact that it survived 100 years, left abandoned, survived a hit with dynamite in the 1930s. The fact that it didn't topple into itself really made us respect the old walls. And as we investigated further, the quality of the build and finding out how good the concrete was, how good the masonry was, just really wanted us to respect the old structure and craftsmanship. The thing I'm most proud of about this project would probably be making it accessible to everyone. We worked really hard to make sure that it was handicap ADA compliant and safe for all ages. The community response to our project has been fantastic. Tourists, people coming through town, locals alike, everyone's been really uh, warm and receptive to what we've done. As a preservationist, traditionally we, we want to look at pretty architecture and say this is why this place is worthy of preservation. But in East Harlem, the reason why it's worthy of preservation is not because it's beautiful, but because it provides lessons for how we go forward. We started this project in June of 2021 by pretty much walking every single block in the survey area, it's 90 blocks. 1,600 parcels, individual building parcels. But what made it manageable is the fact that we knew we weren't looking at an architectural assessment in the traditional sense that most building surveys are. This is really more about understanding how the community exists within the built landscape. The goal of this study was not to deliver definitive preservation action. I, it was more of to lay the groundwork for an ongoing dialogue within the community about what is worthy of preservation, what is significant about the place, and what is, defines the culture of the place. Instead of outlining, you know, just outlining a bunch of buildings, uh, it identified broad themes in education, in housing policy, in faith, and the arts, and how that is reflected in the built landscape. Its heritage is very apparent. It's not hidden in the walls of the buildings. So really this report was about understanding how the built landscape sustains that heritage and how preservation might service it. My name's John Oster and we are in Rochester, New York. Historic preservation is about a third of our business. They tend to be buildings that were originally built for a reason that has disappeared. And so they tend to sit and they become wasting assets for their, for their communities. When we are able to do what we do successfully, they become essentially the pride and joy of their communities. And that's, that's been our experience all over upstate New York. Historic preservation and affordable housing are mutually uh, reinforcing. The scope of work that we have to do in older buildings to prepare them for residential use is often quite elaborate and quite expensive. And so the addition of the historic 
overlay usually ends up working to benefit not only the scope of work, but the financing plan that's inherent in affordable housing projects. I feel a sense of accomplishment. I feel like we collectively have done something that provides the residents with a very high quality living experience. And uh, there's almost nothing I can think of that's more important than that. My name is Steve Jordan, and for the last 20 years or so, I have uh, repaired and restored windows in uh, central and western New York. I grew up in rural West Tennessee. There seemed to be an underappreciation for old houses and nice downtown districts. And, and as a young man, I saw the houses go down one by one, either by neglect or, or fire, or remodeling. I was aware from my jobs that there was a need for people to repair windows. So I started doing small window repair jobs and it just snowballed until I could barely answer the, all the phone calls. So that, that's how I, I kind of stumbled into it. I hope my legacy will be someone who worked tirelessly to promote historic preservation, it's especially, I hope, in rural communities that are suffering so much today. But I hope my legacy will also be through, through my books by, by training future or budding preservation trades people, okay? I think that'll be my legacy. People know me for that. They say things like, he's the guy that wrote the book. We're here at the Little Theater in downtown Rochester. Uh, it's America's oldest art house cinema. When I walk into the space every day, it's uh, the same feeling. It's just great pride in what we've done here and accomplished here. There, there always are gonna be these challenges and setbacks and it's more about how you sort of can creatively and collaboratively address those and keep moving forward for the benefit of both our clients, but also the benefit of these wonderful historic buildings that um, are parts of our community. It it's just still blows me away every day at the, the beauty, the details. Such a magnificent job that, you know, I, I get to oversee every day and experience with people, new people that are uh, enjoying it. I think one of the more meaningful pieces of feedback that I remember hearing from a patron when they got to see this, uh, the project complete, they remarked that um, they had never experienced what it meant um, to be in a place rather than a space until they came to the Refreshed a Little. So when I walk into the building, I'm awed, I guess, by the investment that our forefathers made in this property back in the 1880s. The amount of care and detail that's gone into the place is really awe-inspiring. So we did a 74 7 special permit, which is a permit that allows us to sell our air rights, but a portion of those, uh, the sale proceeds, needs to be invested back into the landmark building. Half of the money that we received from the sale had to go back into the facade of the building. And, um, and so that was the, the predominant way that the building uh, was gonna be preserved. And then a portion of what remained after that, we're gonna spend on the inside to do a major uh, restoration, make the building accessible, which will further enhance its ability to be a community asset. The greatest impact that this project uh, now has is that the building facade has been restored to a, a level that probably doesn't need any significant work for at least another 50 years. 
and that's the burden that's been lifted from this congregation as it ages and we go through intergenerational transformation. We want to continue to open the building up for community use and so we can build those bridges and, and hopefully intersect with more of our community members. I mean, it's always a joy to walk into this theater. Even though there wasn't much light, um, I could tell when I first came in with the ceiling in bad shape or whatever that this place was pretty spectacular. Um, for a small town, you know, away from the big city uh, kind of theater, it was very, very unexpected. When the project was completed, the thing that I was the most proud was the attention to the details, the uh, plaster work and the uh, decorative painting. Um, it turned out so well. Everyone was willing to kind of go that extra length to make sure that things were preserved, they were repaired properly, and they were treated in such a way that uh, we really came back to what we think that it, it originally was. I think any historic property is worth saving. It's definitely a uh, look to the past and a reminder of what Gowanda was. And I think that it's going to be a big part of what Gowanda, you know, is going to be in the, in the future. Fundamental to our mission is preservation, preservation of our 2,000 acre historic site, preservation of our historic structures, including the fort walls and the buildings, as well as additional structures such as this 1826 pavilion. So truly in this whole structure, what we realized was all the layers of Ticonderoga's story going back to the 17th, 18th, of course, 19th and 20th centuries, we have encapsulated in this building, which is just so remarkable and just so important and uh, quite special that we're able to share that with people. This beautiful space um, will not only, and has not only with the restoration project, saved a national treasure. And of course that commitment and investment is ongoing, uh, but it has positioned Fort Ticonderoga for a really vibrant future, expanding our audiences, offering different experiences to our visitors, and really becoming such a critical part of the Fort Ticonderoga experience. Preservation, uh, is absolutely economic development at its best. And we know from data that people who visit these kinds of places actually spend more money uh, when they visit those communities than other types of tourism. So we're thrilled to be a major economic driver uh, for the region and New York State. Preservation is, is a one-time opportunity to save our history. And once a building is torn down or let deteriorated beyond restoration, it's gone. For the community, um, it, it now is a, a source of pride where it once was exactly the opposite, taking the building from a, a really an eyesore uh, and a hazard to something that is a functional, useful, accurately restored historic building. We've had, by recorded data, over 45 people have been involved in the project and over 15,000 uh, person hours involved. So it was actually fairly easy to recruit people or to encourage people to come and, and do whatever they can. We certainly hope that this building and this project will last for many, many generations. Uh, it's a fine, sturdy building now. 
All it needs, like any building, is continued maintenance and usage. We want it to become more and more a part of the community. And I think a, a symbol to the community that buildings can be restored. They don't have to be torn down. I think this building in particular was sort of a turning point for the community. I like to describe it as sort of planting a flag on the lunar surface, you know. Here we were saying with this one, you know what, our historic downtown matters and uh, we're going to do something about it. You know, when I walk in in the morning, there's uh, already a buzz of activity and we're nowhere near open. There's a whole crew here working and they're putting their heart and soul into making some of the best food in the area. So our tagline at Arts Cafe is save a building, build a community. And for us, it was very literally that. This project started as a sort of glorified hole in the ground. And we wanted to both save this building and the neighboring buildings, and in the process, strengthen our community and bring people together. Historic preservation and renovation focuses on bricks and mortar, but at the end of the day, it's about the human aspect. And it's been really fascinating to see how this project has brought people together. That's been really rewarding. And even though we planned it, it's just been surprising to see it happen in, in real time. You know, pr pretty remarkable. Congratulations to this year's winners. Recipients of the Excellence Award represent the very best of what the League stands for and supports in historic preservation. And I think you'll agree, the people we just heard from are truly deserving of such recognition. They exemplify best practices in the field and demonstrate how preservation is integral to building stronger neighborhoods, boosting local economies, tackling the affordable housing crisis, mitigating climate change, opening our eyes to overlooked history, and saving the places that are special to all of us. New York is a big state, and this year's winners show us that great preservation work is happening all over. As you saw in that wonderful video, all of tonight's honorees have a truly remarkable story to tell. So for the remainder of tonight's program, Jay and I will do our best to help tell them. Thanks, Caroline. We're gonna do things a little bit differently this year, for those of you who are familiar with this program. One thing that struck the jury was the interesting points of intersection between this year's winners. So with that in mind, we'll be diving a bit more into all of them in pairs, looking at each project and how it relates to broader issues within the preservation field. Above all else, what the, what the awards jury looks for is excellence. On top of that, we wanna make sure award winners have true statewide significance. Sometimes a building's architecture is significant, other times, something about the process makes it particularly meaningful. In the case of both the Koshekton Pump House and the El Barrio Cultural Resource Survey, there are lessons to be learned and applied regardless of where you are. I think both say something about the state of the preservation field and how people are working to expand the narrative about what is considered preservation. The Koshekton Pump House is a solid example of this. Here you have a ruin, a building shell that was deteriorating in place, not something that could ever be traditionally restored, but it still provides a tangible link to the past, one that held uh, meaning to its community. The stabilization of that ruin created a real amenity. And it's worth noting that stabilized ruins, while fa fairly uncommon here, are quite common in other parts of the world. Originally a pump house for crude oil, the structure was abandoned when the oil fields ran dry and scrapped for steel in the 1930s. The roof was gone, 
The property became overgrown with vegetation and was mostly hidden from view. In his nomination, owner Dave Lieber noted that every weekend, there's at least one contractor or builder who tells us how well made the building was. We've heard hundreds of stories of the old space. The phrase, they don't make them like they used to, comes to mind. And indeed, this quality craftsmanship is exactly what made the Koshekton Pump House ideally suited to be stabilized. Now the Pump House is experiencing a new chapter in its history as an open air gathering place that has captured the imagination of locals and social media followers alike. The El Barrio Reconnaissance Survey, which I'm proud to say was funded in part through the League's Preserve New York grant program, provides an intellectual framework for how one neighborhood can choose to recognize its history. El Barrio has a multi-dimensional history of land development, class, immigration, and self-determination. It remains home to predominantly working class and multi-ethnic population, and its rich Puerto Rican history is considered nationally significant. Often, reconnaissance surveys like this one focus almost exclusively on the built environment, but here, it's the cultural history of El Barrio that is central to the community's identity and its significance. For this project, research was driven by pertinent social themes rather than architectural expression, with community surveys and inclusive conversations helping to define those themes. Another important aspect of this survey was the focus on New York City Housing Authority public housing complexes, a distinguishing feature of the neighborhood. The practical impact of highlighting these significant buildings is, is, is that they're recognized as eligible for historic register, for the historic register and federal and state historic tax credits can be used to facilitate the rehabilitation. This brings both recognition and resources to a predominantly overlooked building stock that is particularly important in East Harlem history. Ascendant Neighborhood Development Corporation and the landmark East Harlem Coalition are taking a holistic approach to how they think about historic preservation in places like El Barrio. The studies they've done, including this one, are providing a framework for considering how preservation and landmark designation can help their community and the people who call it home. Their inclusive approach can serve as a model for communities across the state and beyond. Now, both of these projects are examples of how people are expanding what it means to do preservation work. And that's extremely exciting to see. It is exciting to see, Jay, and it was especially interesting to see um, the area that you said earlier, this distinguished with the variety and the concentration of public housing um, in East Harlem. And um, I just have to quickly share that reviewing the El Barrio survey reminded me of my experience in grad school where Marissa and I were both in the same class at Columbia's Historic Preservation Program. And our friends and our classmates um, walked the entire length of 14th Street River to River, um, which was our area for studio. So in Rochester, two of our winners this year have decades of experience using preservation to bolster their communities. Edgemere Development was founded just over 20 years ago. And during that time, the company's integrated preservation into their portfolio of work in a meaningful way. Edgemere is committed to working with both nonprofit and for-profit housing developers, public housing authorities, and health systems to create affordable housing and mixed-use developments throughout upstate New York, often repurposing vacant and underused historic buildings. They have successfully completed 19 adaptive reuse projects, creating nearly 4,000 un units of family, senior, and special needs housing. Adhering to the Secretary of the Interior Standards, the projects benefited from $83 million in state and federal historic tax credits. The quality of the work and their additional focus on sustainability has made them a leader in the field. And we all know that the greenest building is the one that's one already built. Edgemere's commitment to tackling challenging adaptive reuse projects has given new life to historic buildings, ensuring those building materials are saved providing a community benefit instead of ending up in a landfill. Demolition and construction waste are leading causes of greenhouse gas emissions and rehabbing buildings and reusing building materials is integral to a more sustainable future. For his part, Steve Jordan has saved countless historic windows, wood windows from being wastefully discarded. Steve literally wrote the book on wood window repair and over his 30 year career, 
has authored many more books and articles tackling all sorts of preservation-related topics. Steve has been working in the field since 1988 and turned his focus to wood windows, in particular, back in 2002. Speaking to an audience full of preservationists, we probably don't need to tell you how important it is to preserve wood windows. But sadly, many people who buy older homes assume wood windows are inferior when really, in most cases, they just need a little maintenance and love. Steve Jordan saw a need in the Rochester area for someone who could repair and restore wood windows, and he became that person. And in the ensuing decades, he has shared his technical expertise through countless workshops and, of course, through his writing. A pillar of the Rochester community, his dedication to the preservation trades and commitment to teaching and supporting other craftspeople has extended his area of influence well beyond Western New York. And I'll just say that anyone who works in historic preservation knows that it can be very difficult to find skilled craftspeople like Steve Jordan. We need more like him. In fact, the League and our statewide partners in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont are working on strategies for bringing more young people of diverse backgrounds into the trades. And it's, it's, really, it's really needed. So bravo to Steve and all that he's done. So our next two owners are very different, a large church and a little theater. In Rochester, the rehabilitation of the little theater reinvented a beloved independent movie house. In Brooklyn, the exterior restoration of the Church of St. Luke and St. Matthew stabilized a historic house of worship. Both projects demonstrate how historic buildings with strong local ties can serve as that important third place within a community. In their nomination for the Little Theater, project architect Barrow Architecture noted that they wanted the rehabilitation to go beyond a functional space, transforming the theater into a communal place of shared memory, immersive aesthetic experience, and future possibility. The Art Deco Theater was once part of a national network of over 40 little cinemas dedicated to showcasing the work of independent and foreign filmmakers. It has served as a progressive, an inclusive cultural hub in the Rochester area for over 90 years. The thoughtful rehabilitation brought much of the original appearance back to life. From the restored facade to the reintroduction of original auditorium sconces that had been found elsewhere in the building. The work also recreated original features that had been lost or damaged. Wrought iron stair railings, crown moldings, auditorium seating were faithfully reconstructed using historic documentation as a guide. Elements of the original design that were never constructed due to budget constraints back in 1929, including the terrazzo flooring and a full width stage with herringbone patterned oak floor were incorporated as key elements of the new project. But what sets the little theater apart is the seamless integration of these historic elements with a true focus on how the theater will be used now and in the future. This isn't a stagnant place, it's a community hub. It's full of life and serving the people of Rochester with alternative cinema, as well as films, music, and visual arts made by, for, and about people of color, women, LGBTQ, and other underrepresented communities. The organization has expanded beyond the walls of this original little theater, allowing this historic structure to connect with a more modern cafe and multiple screens. The flexibility of the place by design allows the little to be nimble, serving its community in ways that are most meaningful at any given time. So churches are also a classic example of a third place, outside of work or school, a place where people can come together as a community. The Church of St. Luke and St. Matthew has served as that place for their Brooklyn community since it was built in 1888. The building has suffered fire damage twice, first in 1914 and again in 2012, the church has been fortunate in that it has maintained an active congregation for well over a century. But with two fires and a century of general wear, it needed serious restoration work. A designated landmark, the church's polychromatic facade features seven unique stone types, all of which needed to be cleaned and repaired. As so often happens, the brownstone was found to be in the most deteriorated condition, with many units losing up to one half of their original total depth. This was particularly challenging because of a, of a shortage of natural brownstone, a complication that increased project costs. Encaustic tile flooring in the entryway, stained glass windows and roofing materials similarly needed to be repaired. This was a major undertaking for the parish. 
and one that intended and one intended to reestablish the church as a physical beacon in the Clinton Hill neighborhood of Brooklyn. The restored exterior is certainly a great example of excellence in historic preservation, but there's another aspect of this project worth, worth mentioning. Financing large-scale restorations like this one can be difficult or impossible. St. Luke and St. Matthew's small congregation could never have funded a restoration of the quality, scale, and complexity required to return this historic resource to its former architectural glory without the benefit of New York 74711 special permit process. This unique land use process symbiotically benefits new construction and underfunded historic properties. This successful project can serve as an example of how preservation and development can work in tandem to revitalize communities and promote long-term stewardship. Yeah, Jay, that's really true. Uh, you know, historic churches can be so challenging um, for their congregations to maintain, but you know, there are groups that can help. And I just wanna say that our colleagues at the New York Landmarks Conservancy have assisted with St. Luke and St. Matthew's project for years, beginning in 2011, um, when they helped uh, them secure a tenant to generate income. And now Gallum Dance provides a live and virtual program that honors that diversity, inclusion, and equity uh, through meaningful art and providing a real asset to the community. And another way uh, we know preservation can have a positive economic impact on local communities is through tourism. The restoration of the Hollywood Theater in Gowanda and the pavilion at Fort Ticonderoga are great examples of this. At opposite, opposite ends of the state, Gowanda is in the West End and Ticonderoga in the East. These two projects show how a revitalized historic asset can provide new opportunities within a community. Gowanda is a small town with a population under 3,000. The nearly 1,000 seat Hollywood Theater has the potential to draw visitors from throughout the region, bolstering the local economy in the process. Built in 1929, the theater remained in use until the 1970s, at which point it was shuttered and left vacant for decades. A local company, Gernot Asphalt Products, bought the building in 1994 and donated it to the newly formed nonprofit Gowanda's Historic Hollywood Theater. The volunteers behind this effort were dedicated community members who saw the potential in bringing their theater back to life. The restoration was a massive undertaking. And for the last 12 years, the theater has worked with Flynn Battaglia Architects to complete the work in phases. The Preservation League has been proud to support this incredible effort over the years through our Technical Assistance Grant Program. The theater was awarded Tank, tag grants in 2012 and 2015 to support feasibility reuse studies of the main level and the balcony seating areas, um, where it was a challenge to maintain the original aesthetics while also making improvements to accessibility and functionality. The Hollywood Theater is now fully restored and actively serving its community once again. But an important thing to note is that even while the building was very much in progress, great efforts were made to bring the community in every step of the way. For example, as you can see pictured here on your screen, summer theater camps have utilized the Hollywood, even when it was very much still in progress. Tours, school groups, and various events utilize the theater in every stage of its restoration, ensuring that the greater Gowanda community felt connected to and invested in the success of this project. Fort Ticonderoga has long been a destination for heritage tourism in New York State. Before the pavilion was completed, the site generated more than $12 million annually for the local economy. The restored pavilion is a much needed complement to the existing site infrastructure, serving as offices and providing an expansion of educational and hospitality programming space. In 1820, William Ferris Pell, a New York City businessman, purchased Fort Ticonderoga to halt its destruction, one of the earliest acts of historic preservation in the United States. In 1826, Pell constructed a summer house called the Pavilion near the fort overlooking Lake Champlain. After the last member of the original family died in the 1980s, the building fell into disrepair. And being outside the period of significance of the fort, 18th century military history, it was deemed expendable. But thankfully, new leadership at Fort Ticonderoga took a different view. And after completing historic structure report, the pavilion became a National Historic Landmark on its own. A thorough restoration began in 2017 with the removal of a collapsed floor and fallen plaster caused by multiple roof leaks. 
Once a new roof was installed, interior work began in 2019. Since the building was designed as a summer home, it was challenging to preserve its historic fabric while converting to a year-round space that could handle the rough Adirondack winters. Sustainability was also top of mind for the project team, who looked ahead to long-term preservation of the pavilion. Several measures were taken to address the effects of climate change, including increased natural and mechanical ventilation and improved site drainage. As a major cultural destination, Fort Ticonderoga recognized the value in saving the pavilion and giving it new purpose to serve current needs. And we're already looking forward to our next visit. Yes, yes, we are. William Ferris Pell's preservation effort at Fort Ticonderoga actually predates uh, work to preserve Washington's Mount Vernon. So very early. In 2009, the League honored the Pell family with our Pillar of New York Award for their continuing efforts to preserve not only the buildings, but also over 3,800 acres of historic landscapes visible from the ramparts of the fort itself. So it's a, it's a, a wonderful and multifaceted project. All right, our final honorees tonight prove what is possible when hands-on volunteers come together to save a place that is meaningful to their community. Both Open Door and Arts Cafe were in nearly complete dis disrepair, which I think is an understatement. Both buildings would otherwise have been demolished if not for intense local support. In the Finger Lakes, Open Door was once the heart of the Sherwood community and is a contributing property in the Sherwood Equal Rights National Historic District. Built in 1837, this was the home of the Howland family, well known in the area for their vocal support of abolition and women's rights. Despite this important history, the house was left abandoned in the 1970s and remained that way until the Howland Stone Store Museum purchased the building for back taxes in 2008. Construction took place from 2012 to 2021 with an emphasis on repairing as much original fabric as possible and replicating what could not be saved. From restoring original wood windows and French doors to recreating the original paint scheme, most of the work here was done by volunteers. A staggering 14,000 hours of construction labor was donated by over 40 people, including carpenters and finishers, woodworkers, masons, detail painters, and many other skilled tradespeople who joined the effort. Without this incredible outpouring of volunteer support, this project could not have been completed. And now Open Door is open to the public, serving as a second facility for the Howland Stone Store Museum and helping to tell the story of the area's importance in the social justice movements of the 19th century. A very different building with a very different story shared a similar path to reinvention. In 1880, Italianate brick building at, e at 5 East Main Street in Springville served as the home to many thriving businesses for over a century. Sadly, after 20 years of neglect, the roof collapsed into the basement, threatening neighboring buildings and passersby. In 2012, the nonprofit Springfield Center for the Arts acquired the building for $1. From the beginning, the project was propelled by community support. Springville residents rallied early on through an online campaign. Architect Jay Bray Miller donated design work. A new steel superstructure was installed by Iron Workers Local 6 apprenticeship program, providing structure for the building and supporting the adjacent buildings. Labor and love were given by carpenters, masons, and more. The area's first green roof was installed by a crew of 30 trained volunteers. Through sweat and sacrifice, the structure was rebuilt floor by floor. And not only was this one building saved, but by saving it, so was the streetscape a cohesive Main Street facade remains intact. Fittingly, Arts Cafe is owned by the community. To complete the financing and launch the business, SCA created a partnership between the nonprofit, community investors, and worker owners who operate the cafe. This business structure reflects the mission of building community and reinvesting in Main Street. Arts Cafe has become a model multi-use redevelopment creating pedestrian activity in downtown Springfield, driven by the preservation of a historic building. Wow, Jay, yeah, these two projects really show how even in tiny communities where you wouldn't think there would be um, resources and the building so deteriorated, you just, you just wouldn't expect that they could even be saved. So this really shows uh, how preservation is possible. Yeah, that's true. I mean, a place like Open Door goes to show what extraordinary histories 
so many small communities have in New York, like Aurora. Uh, over generations, the Howland family made it a center for abolition and women's rights and so much of the social justice movement of the time. And now visitors can be inspired by the stories told at Open Door as they pursue today's social justice causes. Well, congratulations again to all of our winners. Uh, my personal thank you uh, to you, Jay. Uh, Frank, Charlotte, and the Preservation League staff, especially Mary Lucas for guiding things behind the scenes, and Katie Peace for putting together tonight's program and the digital content to follow. And again, thank you all for joining us tonight. Yes, I hope you enjoyed hearing about all these incredible projects, and I encourage you to stay tuned and follow us at, at Preserve NYS for more about all of them over the coming days and weeks. I'd like to express our appreciation again for Robert A.M. Stern Architects for supporting tonight's program. The League team is also busy working on a programming lineup for 2023, and I hope you'll join us for more great webinars, preservation roundtables, and author talks over the coming months. And if you want to catch up on what you missed this year, check out the League's YouTube page. And I must give a plug for our leadership giving group, the Excelsior Society, which offers even more unique programming during the year. So thank you all for joining us tonight and have a lovely evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you.